This is the first solar hydrogen fuel cell house in North America. All of its energy needs are supplied by solar, geothermal, and hydrogen fuel cell technology. The home's energy sources are totally renewable, and the house is completely off the grid. Refinements to this prototype home system enable subsequent hydrogen fuel cell homes to operate with a very small amount of space required for the gear that makes the house independent. This is not technology for the future. This is technology for now. The home's owner is Mike Strizky, an engineer who won a grant from the New Jersey Bureau of Public Utilities and used it to engineer existing technologies into the system he lives with. His four-year quest to develop and install a prototype system into a working residence was realized in October of 2006. The implications of this achievement are revolutionary. This completely clean technology can be used to power a home, a business, or to bring electrical power to an entire third world community in a way that is not only clean, but also economical. The technology is scalable, and in the U.S., Mike has done the hard work of obtaining local and state permitting so that an architect or builder can specify this technology today and have permits in hand. Mike Strisky's commitment has evolved into the Hopewell Project, a not-for-profit venture created to share knowledge about solar hydrogen technologies. This documentary is about one man's effort to change the world for the better. As a homeowner, how many people have said, you know, it's winter time, it's freezing in here. Why can't I take this stuff, put it in a bottle, and save it to the summer when it's boiling, roasting, and open that bottle up? Well, in essence, that's what I'm doing. I'm taking that solar energy and I'm bottling it and saving it in those tanks till the winter time comes and then I'm uncorking the bottle and turning it into heat and electricity. Uh, there's a little bit of loss in the process, but I'm recovering 50% of that energy. And since the energy I'm getting is free, doesn't produce any emissions, you know, the, the cost of it is all built into the system. So you, the, the system once installed only has minor system costs. With the Hopewell project, we've taken rocket science, um, literally NASA technologies, and brought them down to Earth. So we take the mystery out of it, and we make it simple for people who want to do the right thing, who are concerned about um, the Earth, are concerned about climate change, concerned about the futures of their children, and also concerned about their pocketbooks. That's not an incidental factor. We know that these technologies are not unique to the Hopewell Project. They're not even unique to the United States. If we look at Western Europe, we see that uh, the population density has required them to generate energy solutions that are a bit more sophisticated than the ones we've had here in the U.S. Uh, Asia is working on these things. We know that uh, uh, China is working on them, Japan, India. So it's also a real shot in the arm for the United States to develop these technologies because if we don't develop them and spearhead them here, we will be purchasing them from others. That's the fact. And most people, even if they don't understand the science, uh, which incidentally uh, you don't have to, get very clearly and very quickly that this, this feels right. That's what makes this a, a movement uh, whose time has come and whose power is, is, is enormous, just enormous. I don't want to live for just today. You know, I'm not, I'm not the greedy one that's trying to consume as many natural resources. I want to leave some of these natural resources to the next generation. It takes 100 million years to make a drop of oil. And when it's gone, you're never going to see it again. There's better things to do with it than to heat your home or to power your car. Oil is used in so many things. It's used in pharmaceuticals and plastics and uh, asphalts and things like that to be squandered burning it to heat your house or to, or to run your vehicle. We've got to save some of this stuff for the next generation, not to mention the amount of carbon that we're putting in the air and that we're having to breathe. We have record cases of childhood asthma. This is something you didn't have 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we're not the only ones on the planet. China and India are catching up. They start burning the, the largest coal supply in the world they're sitting on, we're all dead. So, you know, it's a much bigger picture than this tiny little house in the middle of Hunterdon County. But it holds some of the keys to, to, to changing the way we live and, you know, our health and our children's health and our economy. In a nutshell, what we do is we take the mystery out of what's essentially an unknown variable going forward, energy costs. So any business cost calculation that addresses energy costs is right now done uh, as a series of guesses. Nobody knows where the energy prices are going to go. 
Uh, we can do trend line analyses and, and project onto the future and say, well, you know, this is what it has been doing and we suspect it will be doing. But nobody can lock in the numbers. So from a business standpoint, this becomes very attractive because we take the slippery fish of unknown cost calculations and we turn it into hard numbers. Uh, these system costs can be calculated. The amortization and depreciation can be calculated. These are things that we know. And the technologies, as they become refined, indicate that the prices go down. The basic system operation is fairly simple in nature in that the solar panels provide all of the electricity needed to power the home for both the winter and summer. Now we take that power, which is DC electricity, bring it down into, into inverters, which convert it to AC power, which is usable. That AC power is used immediately to supply the household's needs. Any excess electricity that's needed will come from the battery bank or the fuel cells if needed. As the, uh, the season goes by, any excess electricity that is generated during the summer months is stored in my 10 1,000 gallon propane tanks under very low pressure. At the end of a summer season, those tanks would be full. As the, uh, the summer days start to get shorter and my power demands increase because of the geothermal heating system in the house, I have a call for more energy in the winter time than I do in the summer time. So to provide that energy that I saved up over the season, I run the gas through the fuel cell, the hydrogen gas, and that produces an electrochemical reaction which gives 100% chemically pure drinking water. It gives, it gives off freed electrons in the form of electricity and it gives off heat. The heat is used to heat my garage. The water which we recover is used to go back into the electrolyzer to make more hydrogen for the following year. And the electricity is used in the home. So I'm able to store three and a half months worth of energy in those 10 1,000 gallon tanks that only hold the equivalent BTUs in energy of one SUV or 56 gallons of propane equivalent. So you're, you're taking very small amounts of energy and you're making it go very far. Now the thing that, that you know, we're not totally powering the whole entire home off of the, the solar hydrogen. We are part, doing only the part in which the solar panels cannot keep up. All during the year, the solar panels produce electricity and that electricity is used. So when it's in short supply, that's when the hydrogen, the fuel cells and the battery bank kick in to, to pick up the, the shortage. There's been some concerns about hydrogen safety. And you know, when I, when I talk about fuel cells in these schools and to the public at large, everybody brings up the Hindenburg. Well, the Hindenburg uh, is a, a unique story in that what everybody saw burning was not the hydrogen. Hydrogen produces a clear flame and anything that would burn would go up in a tenth of a second. The things that people saw burn in those plane crashes, and it was in a popular science article, is the skin of the rocket ship was doped in aluminum oxide, which is rocket fuel, and the beams were all coated with the same material. As the airship went down, you weren't seeing the hydrogen burn, you were seeing the, uh, the, the skin igniting and the diesel tanks burning. When hydrogen leaks, since it's a lighter than air gas, it travels through the atmosphere at 45 miles an hour. It's one of the only two gases to leave the atmosphere. So it, in addition to being very, very light, it diffuses very, very rapidly in air in order to get to a non-flammable limit, limit faster than any other gas. Looking forward, I think that what's really compelling about the Hopewell project and about the Solar Hydrogen Home project is that it works on so many different levels. It works on a political level, it works on a policy level, it works on an individual level, it works on a financial level to the point that uh, we have business requests uh, that, are, that are very, very specific, people asking us to take them by the hand and uh, include them in this business venture. I've spent a lifetime working on renewable energy and this is the gift I want to give to the next generation. And it's one right now that is so desperately needed. You know, whether it's in the middle of Africa or whether it's in the middle of Alaska or whether it's down in South America. You know, energy rules the planet. All our economies are based on this. And if we keep burning fossil fuels at the rate we're burning it, 
you know, the, the environment is going to suffer. It takes seven days from the air to ch from China to end up here. I'm watching the trees that surround us here dying from acid rain, you know, from the coal burning power plants. There's a cry for these types of technologies out there that are gonna better the quality of life for everyone.